Stanford University. Thank you, Jim, for the uh, warm and uh, wonderful introduction of uh, the type of work that we've been doing. Um, I feel as if uh, he's done a better job than you will probably hear from me now. Uh, but the most important thing is that this is the work of many uh, people, many students. Adrian Burke Naini, who's actually was a student of MSNE, and e um, Minwook Jong, a Huan Liu, employee of Accenture USA, uh, and uh, worked with us in the Wellness Project. Chinmay, who's here, and Deepak Mario, who's also here. Fukumoto from KDDI Labs, Geroid, Christopher uh, Rama, who used to be the head of Infosys Bangalore, uh, Damon Wishik, and Tom Yu. Um, so what uh, you're going to hear can be heard in a few different ways. Uh, you could think of this as a systems, computer systems building effort where the, the uh, effort is to try and have a large group of people uh, interacting with some uh, back-end incentive platform, think of it that way, an incentive engine that uh, senses their behavior and then credits them for it and then allows them to redeem these credits for dollars. Okay? So that's one type of effort you could consider this to be. The other type of effort is, of course, behavioral economics and how people make decisions. Uh, that, that is the other theme. And the third theme is just the, the chance to build some low-cost sensors uh, that we could use in, um, in, our, in, our, in our everyday life, including things like sensing not just commuting times or um, how many steps you've taken, for example, in a wellness program, or uh, it could even extend to things like um, are you being compliant in taking medicine, for example. These are things that people have suggested to us. So it all seems uh, like a good time to be in this sort of nexus between engineering and economics, uh, looking at problems that occur every day around us. So what are societal networks? Uh, and if you have questions, don't hesitate to put your hand up, and it's good to have a discussion going. Uh, societal networks are, think of all the networks we use every day that don't have to do with computing or communication. Okay, so forget the internet, forget the cell phone network, and think of all the other networks we use. Some of them are here, and uh, you could throw uh, waste management networks and utilities as well, for example, we use them all. And the big thing about these networks is that uh, they're made up of technology, some combination of technology policy, because several places, governments own these things, or cities get involved. And there's a, a resource constraint, uh, which is more pronounced in these networks than the bandwidth-rich universe of the internet, or uh, you know, 3G, 4G type systems. And <clears throat> so pricing becomes important. And then this has, uh, this, these type of systems have humans in the loop. So when we think of the internet, we think of the internet uh, as uh, a network in which you know, the, the, the unit that is being uh, processed is, is a file or some, or some uh, you know, unit of uh, data. Whereas uh, with transportation systems, uh, people are both components in the system in that when you go to the, tra the train or the road or the bus, when you go, it matters to the efficiency of the system. And just as there are um, signal lights which consume electricity and produce some useful work, so do human beings consume potentially signals or dollars and can produce useful work or not. And we're erratic, say, compared to other, other types of components. So that's what I mean by systems with humans in the loop. Now, there's been this effort to, to build so-called smarter networks or smarter systems. Smarter planet is a, is a theme, for example, that IBM uh, has been um, uh, cultivating. And uh, what that means, typically, is you take the, uh, the networks that ruled out at the beginning, like computing and communication networks, and embed them in these more, in these societal networks, right? So every time one of those guys gets one of these guys embedded in it, embedded in them, then they become smarter, okay? So smart roads, smart health, smart waste, all sorts of things that are out there. And what could be the work for some folks like us who are in the School of Engineering? Well, we could, uh, you know, uh, my area of research for many years has been, uh, you know, uh, internet algorithms and now data centers and cloud computing. So when I say that, you know, if you look at these kind of networks, we've built very large-scale systems. 
in the span of about five decades. Okay? There's such a thing as a global, single global network called the internet. And so whatever allowed us to build such large scale systems could potentially eat some architectural principles that we could try and see if we could move it up there. Um, and that's one example, how to build robust large scale systems. Second is to spread information. This is the basic idea of smartening. So if the commuters in the network knew where congestion was in some real time way, then they could use that information uh, to you know, sh shorten their own commuting times, provided they were somehow sent well directed to do so. And in order to encourage them to take these recommendations, uh, you could stick them with uh, incentives. Okay? And those could be in real time. So as a bus is approaching uh, towards you at a bus stop, uh, you could make you an offer on your cell phone saying I'm about 80% crowded. If you don't enter me, but take the guy behind me, I'll give you 100 credits. Okay? And if it's 95% full, bus knows this. And it knows you're going to be heading in its direction because it knows you. It makes you an offer saying I'll give you 250 credits Okay? because I'm more full. You're not obliged to take these offers, but think of them as incentives. So it sort of credits back with dollars in some interesting way. Okay? So here are some problems that plague the societal networks that we will try and address. So you have problems like this. Uh, this is uh, New Delhi every morning. This is what it looks like. Uh, lots of people stuck trying to get to work or in the evening it's, it's even worse and lingers longer. But that's not the only place. Uh, the mother of all traffic jams occurred in China, nine day traffic jam, uh, stretching 100 kilometers. Okay? And so out of Beijing into Mongolia, and it just, nothing happened, nothing moved for nine days. And people were selling stuff by the roadside to people stuck in this, things like water and essential stuff. And after nine days, it evaporated in three hours. Nobody knows how, how the condition, you know, it's a beautiful engineering question as to how, how did the condition go away so quickly. Okay, so that's because these areas are experiencing huge growth spurts. And there's more uh, vehicles than potentially carrying capacity. That's not true here necessarily in the US. So if we look at this, a Texas Transportation Institute publishes every year the so-called cost of congestion measured as the amount of time and fuel wasted while we're all stuck in traffic. And this is measured across 437 or thereabouts uh, urban and semi-urban areas. And uh, in 2007, the cost was 87.2 billion and in 2009 is 115 billion. So if you look at the other numbers we saw in the, at that time, 2007, 2008, auto bailout and so on, they're dwarfed by just what we're losing with all the vehicles stuck on in, 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 you know, in, in traffic. The, uh, the hope is that we could you know, bring this down by about 10%. No one's thinking that we can get rid of all 115 billion. Uh, if we bring it down by 10%, 10 it's actually a significant number. But the bigger cost is also here. Uh, vehicles stuck in traffic emit a lot more and uh, traffic is one of the major sources of emissions. And then this is not counting things like parking, which many cities, uh, campuses, uh, companies have a problem providing, and traffic accidents, of course. Okay? So uh, that's the sort of problem we want to get at. Well, if you get cars off the road, it seems that everything will be nicer. Um, in public transit, the adoption is varied. Uh, in the US, we don't have a great track record uh, of public transit adoption compared to, let's say, Singapore or Hong Kong, where it's better, and much better, for example, in Hong Kong. And I was looking at the onion, and I found this interesting quote that interprets that 2% number. 98% <laughs> of US commuters prefer public transport for others. Okay? This is how we all feel when we're stuck in traffic. What are all these people doing here? Why can't they just go take Caltrain? Right? So this is, uh, congestion is one of those kind of phenomena where you're always the victim and everybody is always the perpetrator, right? And then if you look at public transit systems themselves, you've probably seen this sort of video on, the YouTube, on YouTube. Uh, this is uh, Shinjuku Station in Tokyo <laughs> where uh, peak time trains are so crowded that the company hires they hire these people uh, who are actually students. You could, students here could apply. Uh, it's, the job is called Wuxia, which means passenger arrangement staff. Okay? And so, right. 
So this was data networks would compress files. This is the human <laughs> cooler. Right? So, so this is not a problem with just Japan. So London, Seoul, Shanghai, they all have the same problem. These are all sort of big cities. Uh, PCAR, uh, public transit use is huge. And so if you then change, change sectors and look at other areas like health and wellness, it's similar that um, there's a lot of um, uh, inactivity related uh, health issues that are uh, hitting us. And the New York State Department of Health has these numbers. And then the costs are similarly high and staggering. And you know, again, the goal is here to dent it by some percent, 10, 20, something meaningful. And the question is, is that doable? So a lot of self-insured employers, it's actually a good thing if their employees are uh, aware of their own, um, in fact, employees and the employer are aware of their own health uh, you know, numbers like cholesterol and, and blood sugar and so on. In addition, it would be great if they could also do some uh, physical activity. So Stanford, you have the Be Well program, uh, which obtains from us through surveys. Um, actually, they, they incentivize us to go get our uh, medical checkups. right? And so it's good for an, a self-insured employer to know uh, what the risk is that it's assuming. Right? And uh, so if you arrange all these different kinds of societal networks, I mean, one could go on and give lots of examples, but let's say we all arrange them all. These are networks that are resource constrained. Okay? There's all of these networks, and then there's us on top. Now, what I'm going to show you is a typical internet diagram. It's called the hourglass figure. In the internet equivalent, for those of you who know it, this is uh, copper, fiber, uh, satellite, uh, wireless, all the media through which you can carry data, bits. And then on top is all the applications. And the thing in the middle that mediates, there's always some tension. Resources need to be shared. And then there's a mediation that needs to happen. In this case, it's huge demand coming from top and then the short supply from the bottom. And the question is, can we make them meet? Right. It's a canonical question. And it, one way to do this is, of course, to increase price. Right? And uh, could incentives help? Right? That's where we're heading. Now, uh, let's look at other issues in societal networks, because I want to talk about this as a networks person, saying why these networks are actually presenting us with interesting different kinds of challenges. So here's a. Uh, uh, um, a very uh, insidious kind of problem. So if you look at networks and you want to improve their efficiency, often you just say, oh, the edge is sort of bottlenecked. Uh, change that from you know, uh, uh, dial-up cable modems to, to DSL. OK, then suddenly you know, the edge is sort of now much more liberal. Or then upgrade to uh, you know, uh, 10 megabits per second Ethernet or something. And then suddenly, again, it's even more bandwidth. So you can always look at where the problems are, the bottlenecks, and alleviate them. OK, there's one way of making the network more efficient. Or conversely, to, to stem waste, uh, it's, it's nice when you have the problem located. For example, the BP oil leak. Okay? As bad as it was, we know where it happened. We can go and stop it. Right? This is different. Okay? Why? So we saw the congestion cost, and it's close to 80, 80, it's exceeding 80 billion. Now, when you measure it at the individual level, 250 million passenger cars, 250 working days, uh, and then so the cost per person per day ends up being in the order of noise for that person. It's like a half a, less than half a glass of coffee, like a half cup of coffee. So the question is, are we incentivized now to do the small little behavior change that we need to do? Because the cost is not felt by us. Same thing as to why we leave lights on, faucets dripping. It doesn't really make economic sense to us to go and get, get that you know, kind of waste addressed. Second uh, issue, again, from an uh, engineering sense, is you'd like, when you have such highly permeable sort of waste, you'd like to actually measure through instrumentation the exact uh, F, uh, amount of waste. Right? So this is um, where it would be great to have some fine-grained sensing and measurement. So uh, as I said to you, the, you'll see some kind of sensors that we've been using at Stanford, which is RFID-based. You could have pedometers, which we use for the Accenture project. Or you could have other kinds of smart cards that we're using in Singapore, the, the, the sort of card that you use to, to make public transit trips. Cell phones are becoming interesting as an option, and we're moving to that sort of technology looking forwards. Okay? So we have some apps coming out of Stanford for those of you who are involved in the Capri program. So with these problems, what are the current solutions? Well, one is to sort of look at the whole thing on the supply side. 
and you must do that. So you governments typically introduce more capacity, uh, widen the lanes, increase the number of buses and trains, etc. They're pretty expensive. The cost of a new train in Singapore is $20 million. And the, um, uh, the government has added an enormously large number of uh, train trips to alleviate peak time congestion. And it helps to do that. Definitely capacity addition is something that uh, one can do. But it does some of it. The demand has to be managed also. Because right? sometimes adding capacity tends to peak the demand more than uh, lessen it. Because you now have more options in a shorter period of time. So the other, other approach is to do admission control. This is to raise the price. And so there are two ways of doing this. One is explicitly in, introduce charging. And Singapore, London, Stockholm, and other places have done it. And it's a market type solution. Uh, so for example, for a given quality of service, like you know, I want to move vehicles at 40 miles per hour. And if the speed of movement is less than 40 miles per hour, increase price. If it's more, I'll reduce price. Okay? That's a simple feedback mechanism that works. And to do it once in three months is uh, essentially how Singapore does it. And uh, that's one way you could do it. The other way is road rationing. Road rationing is, uh, is what we call time division multiplexing. Or you, know, you have people, and they use the roads. Uh, you know, some people, depending on license plate number, in these places, you give up driving one or more days of the week. Are we OK with this? If your license plate number ends with a 1 you, or, or 6, you give up Monday, let's say, and so on. So you just, uh, physic just reduce the load. Now, there's enforcement issues here uh, where uh, now you have to make sure people are actually adhering to this. And so um, in, in Athens, some, a Greek student of mine said that there are more license plates than there are cars. Uh, that's an obvious solution. And uh, you know, in China, there are more cars per person than one. And so, you know, it's the relative how the economies are doing. And the other challenge with these things is political mandate. Right? Uh, it's very difficult to have a charging mechanism or a, uh, or a road rationing style mechanism unless you uh, vote, uh, you put it to vote, typically. And this can be difficult. Example, uh, Bloomberg in New York uh, tried to get congestion charging in New York in 2008 and uh, couldn't uh, uh, have it put to vote. Uh, even, right? So it's not easy. Now, here's an interesting comment that I heard from the Assistant Commissioner of Police for Traffic. And he said, uh, in Bangalore, given the amount of wealth that's available with those who have cars, there's certainly a willingness to pay. There's no willingness to charge. So politicians don't want to stand up and say, well, okay, let's do congestion charging, then we will you know, manage the demand, etc." Because the problem is that the roads are not good. So you can always cause congestion by giving bad roads, and then say, I'm going to charge to get rid of that uh, congestion that is now uh, occurring on account of bad infrastructure, let's say. And so it could be just a money-making scheme for the government to, to have congestion charging on top of uh, poor infrastructure. So it's very difficult for politicians to sell it to the public. But we could ask the question the other way. So what if we try to hit it with incentives? Is there a willingness to accept payment? And could we do this? Right. So this is basically our approach, as soon as you come to this place, uh, you're sort of looking at um, um, how much money and how do, you, how do you go about doing it. The moment you say, I'm going to incentivize you some behavior, people actually uh, would like to know uh, that they actually paid correctly. We, out here in Stanford, how many of you are part of Capri, the Stanford project? So about, uh, let's say, eight or 10 people. Uh, Capri is something I'll talk about later on, it's called, it's, it's the, it stands for Congestion and Parking Relief Incentives. It's the project we're running at Stanford since April 2nd. And uh, people email us. People say, I, I, I exited in the off-peak time, but I didn't receive credits. Okay? And these are not graduate students, right? Uh, meaning that you know, they may be more interested, for example. Um, and then we have to take a look at this, and I think you sent us an email too, Jim. Yeah, so people are keen to understand how their behavior is related to uh, how the credits and the rewards are given. And here, uh, a variety of different kinds of sensors can be used and ha have been used by us, except for video-based sensing, we've done all the others. 
And uh, you could then incent use the sense behavior to incentivize, uh, incent incentivize the behavior that is desired for the system. Okay, and this could include a variety of different things, including, for example, reducing risky driving. So now you could look at that hourglass figure, which I showed you earlier, and what it looks like in an engineering sense is there are sensors at the bottom, sensing the behavior that we're all exhibiting on these different kinds of network, that produces data to an incentive platform that sorts this data out and presents it as information to users on top, and recommendations potentially as well, and backs it with some incentive dollars. By the way, when I say dollars, you don't think literally of dollars. Companies could use many other things. Um, when we spoke of it in Bangalore, they also considered giving not just money, but rather additional days of leave in the year, for example, which is gold dust for people. And then uh, in Google, uh, when we presented it, one of the things that was discussed was, uh, or in Facebook as well, one of the things that was discussed was uh, massages, acupuncture possibly, uh, <laughs> right? Or other things like this that people may value. Uh, you know, bring your car in the off-peak time and park it where I say you should park, and we'll have it washed, for example, is, an, is something that there's this sort of in-kind rewards that people may value. Okay, so um, another insight, first insight we're going to use for addressing congestion, this talk's going to be mostly about congestion and not, I'm not going to talk about the wellness project that much. Um, congestion, for those who do networks, this is a very well-known thing. All load versus delay curves will look like this, convex increasing and the slope will soon exceed one. And so uh, if you go to a congested network and reduce the load by some small percent, the reduction in congestion measures like delay or occupancy is, is much more than the reduction in load as a percentage. Okay, so this is one of those things that's peculiar to congestion. It takes many people to cause congestion, but surprisingly a few people to get rid of it, okay? And that's the thing you want to exploit somehow. And so, uh, the other, so the other thing is, of course, you soon have to ask how much money, right? And how do you, who, who comes up with this money, right? And one thing that, as Jim said, that we will uh, exploit is his observation that small good deeds don't carry adequate rewards, so they aren't performed. Uh, however, if you pool the small individual rewards and pay out through a raffle or a lottery type mechanism, then that could carry the adequate incentives. Now, here's uh, an example. It's a participating seminar. So I'm gonna offer you a game, hypothetical. Uh, imagine I have two envelopes. In envelope one, I have $100. Envelope two, uh, I have $11,000 with 1% chance, and with the remaining 99% chance actually empty. So if you pick envelope two, you'll get $110 on average, but 99% of the time you get nothing, okay? So can I get a show of hands as to how many of you will choose envelope one? Okay, uh, envelope two. Okay, risk, you know, okay. Some people, you know, chose the risky option. Okay, let's reoffer the game at 100th of the dollars. Okay, so uh, envelope one with, which has now one dollar, envelope two has $110. Who wants the, who wants envelope one? Okay, so for the, nobody, for the record, right? For those of you watching the video or something, okay. So, uh, sorry? So does it cost anything to choose one or the other? No, it's, you'd have to choose one, you're right. So as a default option, you might choose one. Imagine you had, you had the first envelope in your hand. The question is, could you, would you trade it for the other one? That's one way of asking the question, right? I give you the deterministic reward in your hand and then ask you, would you trade it for the riskier option? That's, that's a canonical way of asking the question, actually. So theorem is that you know, if, you, if you choose envelope two in version one, if you chose the riskier option here, you'll continue to choose it here. It's a theorem, I'll show you the statement next thing, next slide. And the nice thing about economics, as we've all learned during this work is, if my theorem is not right, you're irrational. <laughs> Perfect. All of you stop doing engineering, jump into economics, you will be blamed less, okay? <laughs> okay, so there's a statement uh, but the Deepak and I came up with, under some conditions of utility function, you can show that if people are expected utility maximizers, then they will, at, at low uh, uh, payoffs, they'll choose the risky options, riskier options. So let's apply it. Here's a, here's a fake example, just to warm us up to the application of these ideas. Uh, we've all, several of us, I'm sure, are frequent fly uh, travelers in some 
uh, you know, uh, our favorite airline. And let's say we go look for a mileage ticket to Europe. It's available, and the airline says 50,000 miles for the ticket. And that's what we have right now. But suppose the airline considers another option, which is it says, I'll give you the same ticket for 500 miles. And if you fail to win, I, I, this is 1% chance, you will get the same ticket for 500 miles. If you fail to win, uh, then you lose the miles. You lose the 500 miles. Everybody OK with this? The reason this offer is interesting is that for every 100 tickets sold in this option two, the airline collects 50,000 miles, 500 times 100. 50,000 miles are collected. And on average, one person wins, right? One in 100 chance, right? 100 people play. Airline collects 50,000 miles. On average, one person wins, OK? So the airline's books are sort of probabilistically clear. In the law of large numbers sense, it will clear if there's enough people doing it. Now, are we OK with this? So uh, what's an unattractive? So several people will probably take it. Let's say considering this option, 25,000 miles with 50% chance, uh, the stakes are higher and it's less attractive. That is, you lose half your miles for, you know, for half the chance of winning. So one in two persons will win and not feel particularly lucky, but certainly the other person will feel pissed off. Right? So this is sort of the low stakes making some sense. Right? Faculty salary increases. Okay? I was surprised there's an Occupy University movement at all, actually, because if you guys knew what we were getting paid, you know, you must think that we, must, we work for a love of something other than money. <laughs> but, okay, so here's how you make proposals to the dean to make sure he doesn't put you on committees. Right, so faculty salary increases are 2% per annum. We all know this. Okay, so don't let you get deterred graduate students. So option two could be 200% with uh, one in 100 chance. Okay, this could be an option. So that's an example. So let's see if we can apply it from real Real, real example, real networks, real deployments. So here is the a list of pilots that we've run. Those are in black, and the ones that are currently in progress are in red. Uh, Instant, the project that uh, Jim mentioned, is in, running in, or ran in Bangalore over a six-month period. Um, we ran a recycling project at Stanford as part of a freshman seminar uh, sequence. So you get five cents in the state of California if you return one of the small bottles or cans uh, at the recycling facility. Uh, we gave the option to recyclers to either collect that deterministic option or a $1 or a $5 or a $10 or a $50 or a $100 option with uh, the risk being adjusted so that the expected payoff is always $0.05. Cents. Okay? And uh, we have the results, but I, I'm not including in this thing. People did choose, as we expected, the riskier option, but nobody ignored the, the, um, even the $1 option, for example. And so uh, Steptacular was a wellness project we ran with Accenture USA last year, over six months. Uh, steps get converted to credits, get converted to dollars, is the sort of uh, mechanism. And I'll show you how it works now in this project. Um, uh, this is InSync, is a project currently underway. Uh, it stands for Incentives for Singapore's Commuters. They are public transit commuters using trains, and uh, which tend to be uh, crowded in the peak times. So we're trying to incentivize them to take off-peak trains. I'll uh, show you how it works in a second. And Capri is the project I've talked to you about at Stanford. So here is the InSync uh, project. The goals of the project are to incentivize off-peak travel and to encourage people to be more loyal to the public transport system. So move from your car to, your, uh, to, the, to the bus or the train. And so in, figure, in pictures, it looks like this. You're a commuter. You go from some station. Uh, using your smart card, which is the sensor here, uh, to make a trip. And this generates a commuting history. And the kilometers you took get converted to credits. This is like an airline miles program. Okay? If you took a 10-kilometer trip, you get 10 credits. If you took the same trip in the off-peak time, uh, you get three times the credits. Okay? And that's it. So that's the equation. And people just understand what the times of travel are and what's peak and what's off-peak. And this all gets input into an InSync portal, um, which uh, has a, a uh, you can look at your credits, just like, in, uh, like an airline program. And then you can go read in this for rewards, cash, or, uh, or cash equivalent. I mean, cash equivalent is coming later, perhaps. Okay. So this is the program. And let me, uh, 
Actually, let me describe the Stanford project briefly, and then I'll show you what things look like right now. Um, so Stanford, uh, it, it, sorry, it didn't launch in January. It launched in April 2nd, on April 2nd. Uh, some of you have been involved in the beta testing from March, but the official launch was April 2nd. Uh, what it does is uh, Stanford has an agreement with Santa Clara County that limits the number of vehicles that can enter the campus or exit uh, in the morning and evening peak hours to be those numbers. Okay? And uh, these numbers are numbers from 2000, 2000, and it's called no, new, no net new traffic. Okay? And so uh, Stanford has wanted to build more buildings. Uh, more buildings means more jobs, means more traffic. Um, uh, the county has said, you know, there's just more vehicles on the road, and we need to keep the numbers down. And so every year since we've kept the numbers down, but you know, we keep sort of inching up. Um, there are uh, um, most of the mornings are fine, evenings are close to the limits, and uh, there are lots of programs that Stanford has offered. You all probably have seen this. This is the Marguerite bus. The back of most Marguerite shuttles has this uh, reduced peak hour trips. There are 16 gates through which you can enter the campus. And uh, traffic is measured for six weeks in the fall and eight weeks in the winter, spring time. And there's an audit company, company that audits us. And there's a project that the US Department of Transportation has funded. And the sensing occurs through RFID parking stickers. These are uh, tags that go on your windshield. They look like fat band-aids. And as you drive in, uh, an RFID scanner, one of these gates, senses your arrival or your departure. And so that's how it knows what time you left or arrived and then gives you credits, okay? And the, uh, the scanner technology is exactly the same as the one that's used for the CIRIT, the fast track system in the Bay Bridges, you know, the Dumbarton Bridge and all the other bridges use this same technology, except that their in vehicle units are active, ours is passive. So let me now show you, before concluding, how these things look and what the data, preliminary data looks like. Um, so let me first show you the websites, starting with Singapore. So this is the uh, administrative uh, stats page, meaning that it's available to us to see. So it is updated every minute. Right now, there are 15,026 people signed up in Singapore. They're in various stages. The rest of the numbers shouldn't mean anything to you. Uh, there's some stats on how they're performing, but I'll show you some slides on it. We have a recommend a friend program, and it's also available at Stanford. So for some number of credits, people can go get their friends to join. And lots of emails have been sent. Again, writing these kind of things is nice uh, from, a, say, an engineering or CS perspective. You can, you can uh, put Facebook Connect or Google and Yahoo Mail Connect and then have people uh, invite lots of their friends in one shot. And several signups have taken place. So it's a big recruiting tool for us. And then there's various amounts of dollars given out uh, again, doesn't mean much to you, uh, shouldn't mean much to you right now, but here are the denominations so far. We've paid out 77,000 odd, see the updates every, every minute. Um, so we've paid out 77,000 odd dollars. Uh, 7,800 $1 prizes have been given out, and so on, uh, $2,800 prizes have been given out to, to lucky winners. Okay, and. Uh, if you want to look at how many people have friends right now, there are 6522. Um, the significance of friends will become obvious to you in a second. This is how the friendship graph looks. And what that is, is that so let me, let me leave it here. So um, Black nodes are platinum, green nodes are members, so this is just different stages in the membership hierarchy. So green nodes are not as well behaved as our uh, silver and gold and platinum, okay? But they're all friends of each other, and they invite each other. And friends are powerful in a way that will become obvious in a second. Sorry. And so that's the Singapore project in, in very high, sort of, uh, at a high level. Let me show you something local now, what the Stanford numbers look like. Um, 
Sorry, this one. So right now in the Capri project, there are 1739 people signed on. And similar numbers, you know, tags assigned, tags scanned in, etc. And there are a total of $10,700 odd dollars that have been paid. And I heard Lee tell me that she's won $30. She's a good commuter. And so you should join. Uh, if you haven't already done so, there is money going. There are not as many friends yet. We're only a month and a half into the Stanford project. People are recommending friends, but they will, this will pick up uh, usually in the second or third month. Now, uh, let me show you uh, how the performance looks. These are numbers from March 21st, so it's not up. It's not, this is Singapore. We don't have Stanford numbers yet. This is numbers showing us how um, behavior has changed, okay, if at all. And so as of March 21st, there were 8,000 odd people. If you remember now, there are about 15,000 odd people that have been admitted. We always give people the option of choosing uh, deterministically or randomly. So in Singapore, if you have 1,000 credits, you can, get a, you can trade 1,000 credits in for a dollar, or you can go and uh, redeem these 1,000 credits in a random uh, lottery that is self-administered. So let me show you how that works. So let me log you into an account of uh, Denise, who's a center manager. And so this is how it looked look if you went in. There'd be a track activity page. You can go read in your credits and you can view your rewards. You can do various things. Um, here's how your friends will appear, like in Facebook on the side. You can look at their status and their performance. We'll see what effect friends have on your behavior. Surprisingly, you tend to behave better or not, depending on how your friends are doing. Um, there's also this news bulletin, which tells you uh, the activity on the site in terms of redemptions. And I'll show you how the redemption works. So someone just won $5 at 4.20 PM. It's now 4.58, OK? Someone won $5 at 1.53 today, OK? So on. So you can sort of see this activity in people are redeeming. Uh, this was much more hectic in Accenture and, and uh, in Singapore as well, OK? The way you redeem your credits is some uh, sort of a raffle mechanism, but a game of chance is a way of having an, a self-administered raffle. Right? You win sometimes, you don't other times. So let's imagine that you had 500 credits in your account, and then you go play this game of shoots and ladders. So every time I spin this wheel, I lose some credits, for example, now. Uh, I lost five credits, right? So I could have this, uh, you know, um, redemption take place like this, and, you know, it'll, I'm auto-playing it now. And sometimes I may win. Okay, this time I wasn't lucky. So I advance in the game. Up, uh, up in the game, it's like a slippery pole, okay? This whole game is like a long slippery pole. There's not many dollars here. There's lots of dollars over there. The chance of winning here is small. The chance of winning there is high. Low status people tend to you know, not be allowed to play higher, and those with high status can go up. So everybody gets paid randomly. The only difference is that as, the, as you increase in the pyramid of good behavior, uh, the mean value of your payout is increased and the variance goes down. Okay, is everybody okay with this? Concept that's what's conceptually happening here. The point about these things is the thing that we're trying to do here is to avoid people making foolish decisions, as Jim said. One way of having people understand what the odds of winning is to just show them in a the game how, you know, what the odds of winning. People understand these things, right? Just intuitively. If I said to you that uh, you know, I flipped a coin with 100, 1 in 100 bias and you lost, whereas the other guy for whom I flipped a coin with 1 in 200 bias won, then you will just not believe that your coin was, you know, had a more favorable bias. Whereas in this, it will become obvious to you that it is the case. OK, so, so that's the uh, way in which redemptions work. So now let me get back to you, uh, to the data. Sorry. OK, so here, uh, people are allowed to redeem deterministically or randomly according to their choice. This is how they signed up. Um, 
lots of emails were sent out now. You remember this number is 6,400 odd now, so it's, all these numbers are bigger. We've paid out more money. So now let's look at some numbers. So when the enrollment started, by the way, uh, this was, we launched on January 10th. Through various media events that the government arranged, uh, we got a huge number of signups. But then we had Chinese New Year, the week of Jan 21st. And then everybody forgot all about us, completely forgot. They stopped commuting for a week, and there is all this festival. It was amazing. Actually, the, the, the sort of how to stay in the public consciousness actually it was a lesson. Don't do anything before Chinese New Year, you know, just things to, things to avoid. So then we launched this Recommend a Friend program uh, on Valentine's Day, February 14th. Uh, and that increased the enrollment here. This, the rate of growth was slow, and then it just picked up. And then now we have other things as well that have improved the rate of growth. So let's look at performance. What you're going to see is a set of four charts like this uh, over and over again, according to different categories of user. Okay? So this is all uh, users that are active in the system, meaning that uh, they have been admitted into the system by selection process, and then they've actually come back and activated themselves. That's pretty much... 90% uh, of the people have accurate themselves. Um, dotted line is the activity of the users in the pool that we've so chosen uh, before they join the program. And that's the, it's a PDF, so the area under the curve is 1. What it shows is what fraction of people are commuting at what time. And this is the morning trips only, so 5 in the morning to 12. Okay? In fact, it starts at 4 in the morning uh, until 12. And the peak hour in Singapore is 7.30 to 8.30 a.m. So if they avoid that peak hour and instead take the, peak, the, the shoulder on the left, 6.30 to 7.30, or 8.30 to 9.30, then they'll get this three times the credits. Everybody okay with this? So avoid the peak, but just go to the shoulders adjacent to the peak. So let's look at the top. That's all people, regardless of how many peak time trips they've made in the past, at least one peak trip is necessary. Uh, that's just the selection criterion. So this is uh, everybody, this is very mild peak time commuters historically, medium peak time commuters, and heavy peak time commuters, OK? So what are you seeing here is that if you look at that solid line, you can clearly see that people have moved to the start of the, you know, the shoulder on the left or the shoulder on the right, OK? The end of the shoulder on the left or the shoulder on the right. And that shift is about 8.6% of trips have moved out of the peak time. And then it's 9.57 over there and 10.76, et cetera. So it's a sort of 10% number is what we were trying to hit, and we've hit that at that time. It's now gone up to about 11 and a half, 12%, and uh, roughly staying there. That's good enough in a way to address congestion. Okay. And if you look at those that are engaged, people who are engaged means that they come to the website and then they recommend friends or they otherwise, you know, uh, redeem in the game. They're just more aware of their performance and they tend to do better than the average relative to those that are not engaged, who do uh, OK, but not as well. I mean, quite, quite, quite a bit worse. Okay. And then here's how the friendship graph looked at that time. And those with friends do much better than average. Okay. And so the social sort of pressure or social competition, social positive effect exists. Okay. And those without friends, by comparison, do only half as much shifting. Okay, so it's sort of non-trivial shift, non-trivial to have. You know, it's very, very useful to have friends, uh, even though you may not be commuting with your friends on the same train or buses. Okay, this is what's interesting. There's an underlying network called transportation network. There's an underlying. There's a, there's a network here called social network of friends. Okay, these people are not on the same trains and buses as you are. In fact, those people are strangers to you, and yet uh, these guys are having an influence on your effect over here, which is really interesting. Uh, users, so again, there's mathematical models that we're trying to develop for all of this, and maybe in a future talk, you'll hear a little bit more analysis. Those who play the game tend to do better, as you'll see. Just keep the numbers in mind, it's like 9, 10, 11 type percent relative to 6 or 7 and 8 type percent. Okay, so those who are really deterministic. This isn't obvious, by the way. It isn't obvious if I asked you the question, who would, who would do better? It's actually, it's not obvious. Okay, this itself is worth digging a little into. So if you have strong interest in psychology and other things, we could set up these experiments. That's the other nice thing about this kind of platform is you could set up interesting experiments. Okay? Those who travel short distances, that is anybody traveling less than the historical mean, um, look at the pronounced sort of shift to the right. 
Um, that is, they, they can afford to leave at 8.30 and still arrive at work on time because they're not traveling a long distance. Same uh, for the first two charts over there. Not true for the long distance commuters who also are inelastic relative to the short distance guys. They don't shift as much. Um, okay, so, so these are the sort of numbers you get and men tend to shift a little bit more than women. Means nothing almost because you'll see the difference is not much. But the way they're shifting is also interesting. They tend to leave a little bit later, whereas women tend to leave earlier when they shift. Okay? And so I think men just like sleep in longer or something. Okay? So that's the end of the few slides that I uh, wanted to show you, showing that behavior shift is taking place. Uh, and we are hopeful uh, that at Stanford as well. So what's happening now is off-peak commuting, and then this is sort of shifting you in time, let's say. Uh, in the fall, we'll be launching uh, parking in less desirable parking lots, like Stock Farm Road or Hoover Pavilion, uh, you know, so shifting you in time and in space. And again, looking for 10 or 15% uh, changes. So I hope you all uh, are excited by this sort of topic, because first of all, they're here and we have to solve these problems. But it's a nice sort of blend of engineering at different kinds of levels, sensor building, building a back-end platform, then designing incentive algorithms. There's a lot of UI stuff that is necessary. People are accustomed to high-quality UI these days. You can't go in and say we're a university project or anything like this and get some <laughs> concession. It is quite simply, you really, it is a service you're offering. And this is the hardest thing. We also have a, basically a customer support service. Emails are answered within 48 hours, uh, guaranteed, okay? And uh, those sort of things are extremely important. And people can get very cheesed off if you don't have, um, uh, you know, good service provided in, in, in all the various different ways. Um, there are a lot of things I've mentioned in the interest of time I won't recap. This is something I've learned, actionable policy. This is something that you know, for an engineering person, the way it's, the, what, what, what comes out is that there's, you can have policy and then there's actionable policy. What that means to me is like, there's theoretical or academic on the one hand and implemented on the other hand. I mean, practical or something like this on the other hand. Um, that's roughly what's meant. There's, there's policy that we, we devise as mental models for how to think about things. An actionable policy could be a deprecated version of that, which is suitable for real-world deployment, okay? This is how all algorithms are designed, right? It's pure algorithms that you like to think about. By the time you take it into the real world, some constraint is like impossible to take into account. And so some modification is necessary. And um, this is something that is good. Uh, these incentives are a grease, okay? If you think of it as, where are all the friction points? Where do human beings just stumble? How can I get you over the hump of, uh, you know, inertia, let's say? And so this is just grease, and you, if you were to think of it that way, you could think of it as go liberally apply the grease when possible, get things moving. Right? Okay, thank you. We have time for questions, yes. and, and why don't you just call on the people yourself, Raji? Okay. Yes. So the uh, master topic that my question comes under, I guess, would be complexity theory, and. Uh, I've got a, a little bit of a preamble and then uh, uh, I think a pretty good question. So the, the environment that I'm thinking of is uh, between Springfield, Virginia and Silver Spring, Maryland. And uh, it's kind of famous because uh, even at CSEC, the other end of the campus, we've, we've looked at what happens with a 20, 20 kiloton dirty nuke and whether your cell phone is even going to help you in a situation where that happens in your commute that morning. And uh, Having been there for months and months and months, I can tell you that there's an incentive if you had a little extra information. I've been in a building where you can park in the fourth level basement, and there could be a 50 megaton nuke that takes out Washington Monument, anything around it, and you'll be okay. So what's the question then? <laughs> well, uh, the point I'm getting at is that safety seems to be an enormous afterthought, and I've, I've meditated upon why, why that is, because it's such a culturally... Uh, difficult. I don't, I, I don't want to cut you off, but I am going to. Yeah. Because I, I'd like to get into a quick set of it's questions. A, it's a quick question. Would with. you agree that with about the same level of complexity, you could make safety the first priority instead of the last priority? It, it is the first priority always. 
Right, so these things you should think of as overlay networks, right? That is, this underlying network that's safe, that runs in signal lights and safety belts and all the laws of the land. No one's doubting that. Then on top of it, you can have incentives that nudge people at some slower time scales. I want to move it to the yeah, first priority is hands up only if you're students right here now first because it's, it's a student class and so I want to get the students uh, with the hands up first and call on them and then next go to non-students. I'm a little confused how the social network element plays into this. Isn't it, or my thinking is that if you're just more invested in this, like you care more about the money, that you're going to spend more time on the website, you're going to build friendships. So I don't quite understand the link that you having friends makes you um, better off. Or like no, I think so empirically, that. empirically that's not quite true. People who spend more time but don't have friends don't seem to perform as well. Uh, people who are engaged tend to, tend to do better than those that are not engaged, so there's another reason why they might do well. But a better way of saying that would be we've tracked people who were in the system and engaging with the site at a certain level that didn't change, but that then got uh, invited to be friends. Then you could see a change in their behavior. Other students. Okay, the floor is open for other people as well. Francis? Okay. I just want to, have you ever, are you considering combining the wellness and transportation? I mean, there's yeah. this picture of it going around on the internet on like, yeah. is it a silent minute for day? People stuck in traffic for day are going to their bike. Yeah, so day. we're going to do bike incentives at Stanford. So if you have bikes, don't feel left out. Don't sell the bikes and get into a car and buy a permit or anything. <laughs> okay, so. I mean, this is where the apps are very helpful uh, that you can track. Yeah. Is there any indication what would happen if in the credits program you, after a while, you made it negative credits. So instead of normalizing to positive numbers, you shifted so this it. Is, this is an interesting point and actually an important one. So when you do the negative credits, then people will hide their bad behavior. It's very easy to say, if, if you came in the peak time at Stanford, if you took off 20 credits from you, all you have to do is peel off that you know, tag and put it in your glove compartment and put it back on, right? So uh, the nice thing about incentive mechanisms is that it changes the whole bur you know, the relationship of the burden, right, is we don't have to enforce anything. When you, ex when you do good behavior, you'll exhibit it to us, right? So the enforcement question just comes down considerably. Is that there? Yes. Uh, are there any privacy issues? Like yeah, sure. There's a lot of privacy issues. All of this is subject to um, the same sort of high uh, standard of privacy that uh, is required of any uh, mechanism out there that has any personal data. So. Um, one thing we, we, again, the incentive mechanisms is a, is a good example. If you want to make a trip and be in, you know, make it incognito or say, as they say, go dark, well, you don't have to put your tag on. Just come in or don't turn your app on, just come in and we won't know it, right? And so those trips are completely private, only known to you, right? And same thing can be true in any of the different other verticals. Uh, the method of sensing your behavior can just be turned off. And we don't lose anything. I want about two more questions here. I, I saw Elton over there with a short question. Yeah, have you um, given any thought, does it make any sense to allow people to buy points so they can keep playing the game? <laughs> and, and do you worry about this encouraging certain per personalities that have a tendency towards uh, gambling to get sucked into uh, online uh, gambling addictions? OK. So for, for the first part, we didn't allow anybody to buy points. We don't want to take money. We're not a mechanism that can take money, actually. That's, that's just uh, not possible with the way we set up. And however, there's a funny story of a, uh, in the Accenture project, Accenture's world headquarters in Chicago. So one of their uh, participants emailed us saying he jumped into the lake with a pedometer in his pocket, and it's no longer working. However, he's ordered a replacement pedometer. Meanwhile, uh, his girlfriend and he have the habit of redeeming credits in the evening, every evening. And so can we give him some credits on credit, right? <laughs> and so, and we thought, okay, kinky, but whatever, you know. So, uh, second question about gambling. It's like, so the, we, again, for the same reason as we're not taking any money, um, in, in that particular sense it's not, we, uh, we fall more in the raffle sweepstake sort of category. And um, if people sort of tend to play the game, it's actually the same attraction that video games have. There's no money taken in video games, yet people like to play them. The, the thing of looking at something moving and then it's doing it to your click or something, that's why people play Angry Birds. There's no money involved, for example. Right? 
Up there next. Okay. Yeah, you, yes. I have a question. You mentioned a lot of networks um, and issues to tackle, and I was just wondering if you could talk about why you're focusing on transportation uh, and not maybe like energy or... We are interested in energy. Uh, we, we have uh, spoken with uh, Bonneville Power Administration in the past. We continue to look for opportunities. Actually, I'm part of a proposal that Jim and several faculty are on. This is an ARPA-E, uh, ARPA Energy funded project. And uh, it, some of this is definitely related in that, you know, uh, energy and transportation share this emissions as a common uh, background problem. Reducing in one way or the other is always helpful. Uh, but if you have a utility that wants to work with us, we'd be happy to do it. Was there something particular about transportation that was? Well, well, it was just, uh, it started with me being stuck in traffic in Bangalore, right? And then, <laughs> I mean, as a networks person, we, you know, one conversation led to another, and then we started to do something. Yeah. And when, when Balaji first made the proposal, the right. Bangalore one was funded by the pre court Energy Efficiency Center. The argument is maybe it's not energy, but there's an awful lot of environmental impact and energy wasted simply because of the congestion. But more importantly, if you, if you get these techniques working on this area, you probably can expand them to a lot of other, con other areas. Okay, we're going to do one more question, uh, randomly distributed to that gentleman there. So I was really fascinated with the prob probability distribution functions and these, the growing shoulders right outside of the window. And I was wondering, um, at what level of participation do those shoulders actually begin to impact traffic? And could that even, ever even be reached? Now, if you have, uh, no, it, you can reach it if it's open to everybody. By the way, this is limited to 20,000 just by, we can't handle more than that in the university project. Right now, students are answering all the emails, right? So there's a call center running out of Packard that answers emails. And so it, this is sort of, and, and monies need to be paid. This is not trivial, right? So you have a list and then we send it to, the card company, and then they pay the dollars. So there's various logistical things that just limits the university project's scope uh, in terms of people. Um, there's discussion in Singapore to extend this to a nationwide or an island-wide thing, as they say. And so uh, you know, more people are, uh, will be joining. And part of the experiment is to find out at a, at a, at a one-year level, not just the answer to is congestion itself addressed, but also you know, things like stickiness and the things that we need, we'd like to know how, how it scales, for example. Great. I'd like to thank you very much, Balaji. Thank you, Jim. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.